Please welcome again Pastor Paul Blair. We're very familiar with this verse. In fact, we love it. We quote it all the time. 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people this day and age be us, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face. God, not my will, but yours. Oh, God, I want, your, I want you to smile upon me. Oh, God, we need your blessings. Oh, God, direct us and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. Folks, we all love this verse. We love the way it ends and we embrace that promise and we say, oh God, when will you hear from heaven? When will you forgive our sin? When will you heal our land? Only after we have turned from our wicked ways. Ladies and gentlemen, did you know in the great state of Oklahoma, this bastion of conservatism, the buckle of the Bible belt, we killed between six and 7,000 unborn babies last year. God help us. Is that turning from your wicked ways? We have passed an amendment to our state constitution reinforcing God's definition of natural marriage. Now, one politically appointed black-robed uh, czar has determined that he's going to thumb his nose at God and shred our Constitution and the will of 74% of the great state of Oklahoma. Folks, he cannot do that legally. But in 1973, it wasn't legal what Roe versus Wade did either. And the Christians sat on their hands and we now have the blood of some 55 million babies on us. Are we going to just sit and wring our hands and say, oh, what a pity about marriage? Or are we going to turn from our wicked ways? We run about a trillion dollars a year nationally, I hate that term anymore, in a deficit. And we always point our fingers at Washington and say, oh, those guys shouldn't be doing that. Folks, we are complicit because we can't compromise our principles and values fast enough to accept bribes from Washington. We are complicit in the national debt. So, will we? Are we willing to turn from our wicked ways? Folks, you've learned tonight that we actually have the ability. It's not vote, hope, and cope. It's not beg at the feet of the Supreme Court for them to do something. The sovereign states are who establish the general government. The general government only has authority that we delegated to it. It's up to us to say no when they get outside the box that we put them in. Look at the words of Thomas Jefferson, not Paul Blair. The several states composing the United States of America are not united on the principle of unlimited submission to their general government, but that by a compact under the style and title of Constitution for the United States and of amendments thereto, they constituted a general government for special purposes, delegated to that government certain def definite powers, reserving each state to itself the residuary mass of right to their own self-government, and that whensoever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force that to this compact each state acceded as a state and as an integral part to its, to, uh, its co-states forming as to itself the other party that the government created by this compact was not made the exclusive or final judge of the extent of the powers delegated to itself since that would have made its discretion and not the constitution the measure of its powers but that as in all other cases of compact among powers having no common judge each party 
has an equal right to judge for itself as well of infractions of the mode and measure of the redress. Folks, did you realize we have the ability to stop abortion in the state of Oklahoma? Did you know any of this when you came in tonight? What do you think would happen if 3.8 million, million Oklahomans were able to learn what you now know? Recognizing that the power has all along rested in the hands of we the people. What would happen? Folks, I think we could encourage our legislature, and we've got many legislators here tonight. And I think we could encourage our governor, as we have recently with her rescinding Common Core, we were successful in that. That was we the people, educated people. That was not something she wanted to do. She was a proponent for it, but she heard the voice of the people. A couple of years ago, she had accepted over $50 million of health care exchange money from the federal government. Again, where did they get the money? I thought we were running a deficit. How did they come up with $50 million to offer to us? And she accepted it initially until she heard the voice of we the people and the Senate back. We are the government of the state of Oklahoma. And our legislators will listen to us, but we have to, our thousand plus here this evening, reach the other 3.8 million. So this is where you come in. This is where our strategy is. We're going to run a campaign on knowledge. Unfortunately, we aren't a very intellectual society anymore. People don't read 500 page books. They listen to television commercials. They listen to radio commercials. They do one minute, two minute, three minute YouTubes. So we are gonna have to be very sophisticated and basically run a campaign for liberty in the state of Oklahoma. Here's what we have budgeted to do if we can get the cooperation and raise the money to do it. We plan to run 60 30 second radio spots every day on talk, rock, and country in Oklahoma City and Tulsa for 13 weeks during the legislative session. That will cost about $200,000. We plan to run television commercials for three weeks, one uh, 30 second commercial during the evening news on each of the major networks in Oklahoma City and Tulsa, again, for three weeks during the legislative session. That will cost about $100,000. We plan to run half page ads in the Sunday paper in Oklahoma City and in Tulsa for five consecutive weeks. That will cost about $50,000. We need a full-time staff member that can devote his time to traveling the state, meeting with small groups, and coordinating our grassroots efforts. A salary of about $65,000. We need a full-time assistant, a salary of $25,000. We need technology, internet, email, Twitter, Facebook, $20,000. Academic counsel, men like Brian McClanahan that we can call and have on the payroll to give us direction in some of these uh, arguments and issues. We need rent, phone, and utilities. We need miscellaneous expenses all together. Now, this is a bare bones. Quite frankly, we could use double this or triple this. Think of how much money was poured into these, the U.S. Senate campaign. And that's going to get us nothing. Folks, let me tell you, we've had one of the best senators in history in Tom Coburn. Well, we're still seven, hold on a second, let me, let me, let me make the point. We're still $17.5 trillion in debt. We're still murdering babies every year. The answer is not in Washington. The answer is in the state of Oklahoma. Go ahead, now that's worthy of an applause. You say, that's an awful lot of money. Yeah, I'd agree with you, that is an awful lot of money. But we've got people in this room that have the wherewithal to write a check and they could do that if this is really important. But here's what I'm asking to do. If we had 1,000 people that were willing to contribute $10 a week, that's $1.35 a day for one year. 1,000 people 
that will join together and not just talk. Oh, I'm going to quote 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Oh, isn't it terrible? 55 million babies murdered. Oh, isn't it terrible what Washington's doing? Shut up. I'm tired of hearing it. We've got an opportunity to actually do something about it. Will you join us? That's the question. Will you join us? 1,000 people that would do $10 a week. Make a commitment. Gentlemen, would you pass out the envelopes, please? Just hand them down the aisles. We're going to give you an envelope. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, to prayerfully consider what's on this envelope. We've got op options here for you to be able to commit for one year. You can contribute weekly or monthly or quarterly. I've got a box here to commit for $45 a month for 12 months. That'll get this done. That's what I'm talking about here. $45 a month. I think virtually everybody in this room can afford that. Some can do far more than that. Some may just want to make a one large contribution. Some may want to have a credit card draft. Folks, we need the support. $500,000 is a lot of money. But divided amongst 1,000 people, divided over 52 weeks, it's really not. It's, about, it's less than a cup of coffee every day. But is, is it important? Is it important? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have been told every four years that this is the most important election of our lifetime. If we rally around the party, we'll take back Washington. How has that worked for us? First time I voted was in 1980. Uh, 81, or excuse me, as, as the election following uh, 80, I, I turned 81, uh, 18 and 81, Reagan f came to power or, or was elected in 80. So I first, the first time I had a chance to vote for president was the re-election of Ronald Reagan. My goodness, I didn't realize that was the high water mark. <laughs> but the sad thing is, as I look back at this, ladies and gentlemen, in 1980, over 204 years of our country's history, we fought two world wars. We fought our war for independence. We had the Civil War. We had the Spanish-American War. We had the War of 1812. We had all of this, 204 years. We had accumulated $1 trillion in debt. That's it. In the last 34 years, we have gone from $1 trillion to $17.5 trillion. Now, I've always been the guy that said, well, it's those dirty Democrats. If we could just get the Democrats out of office, we'd be better. Folks, let me tell you, over the last 34 years, we've had 20 years of Republican presidents. We're complicit. One thing that really turned the lights on for me, I saw on Fox News on a Saturday morning within the last, oh, year, year and a half, had two expert commentators get up here back to back. And one of them just made the observation that there are 12,000 lobbyists in Washington. Isn't that comforting? And the next one made the statement that there are, that eight of the 10 wealthiest counties in America surround Washington, D.C. What a coincidence. Folks, Washington is not going to restrain itself. It doesn't matter who we send there because of the sin nature of man. Washington is too profitable just the way it is. The only way we're going to restrain the growth and overspending in Washington is if those who created it will actually rein it back in. That's where we have the opportunity to act. That's where we must act. I ask you, join with us. Fill this out. Drop a check in it. Visit our table on the way out. Take it home with you. Pray about it tonight. Look at it. Set it right there on your kitchen table and stare at it before you go to bed. And pray if God would have you to do something. But let me tell you, I've busted my tail as these men have. We have been at this for a long time. We're doing our best. I travel. I'm always, I meet myself coming and going at the airport. I'm tired of it. If you, the people, aren't willing to invest with us and join with us, then why carry on? Folks, let's take this thing back. Just the people in this room here tonight, we can be the fuse that ignites this. Edmund Burke, thank you. Edmund Burke says all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Let me say we have churches across our state full of good men doing exactly this. I'm going to close with three slides. First of all, I want to make this statement. We talked a while ago about the condition that the country was in when the 18th century church 
had the courage to stand in the face of tyranny. Here you see some religious leaders pledging their allegiance to Adolf Hitler with political leaders. This slide comes from the United States Holocaust Museum and it talks about the condition of the German church during the rise of Nazism. They were having economic troubles. They had a charismatic leader come to power. One of his ideas to resolve the problem was to get rid of the sovereign states and unify under national socialism. Well, a lot of the church thought it was a good idea. As a matter of fact, this segment said some of them were all for it. They liked this fiery new leader, brought back national pride. Some recognized how dangerous this was. You're going to learn about this tomorrow. Oh, you've got to be here. This presentation that Dell is going to do on the state is phenomenal. Some recognized the dangerous path that we were going down, tried to stop it. But most simply wanted to remain neutral. Churches just, Christians just didn't want to get involved. Oh, we might lose our tax exemption. Oh, they might say some bad things about us. You know, history tells us that there were six million Jews that ultimately died in the concentration camps. I bet if we had a chance to give them a vote, they would have said, hey, church, do something. There were some 12 million altogether that died in those concentration camps. Hey, if we could hear their blood crying out from the ground, they would have said, hey, church, why don't you do something before it's too late? There were over 40 million people that died in the European theater alone, both civilian and military personnel. Boy, if they had a chance to vote, I bet you they would have voted that the church got off its butt and did something. One of the men that attempted to do something was this gentleman, courageous pastor named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Before it was all over, he wound up giving his own life as he was doing everything he could to try to save the lives of others and head off what was going on in his country. Bonhoeffer made this statement. He said, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act.